1, 2. Blabla. Ah, ah. We will start in two to three minutes, okay?
です。Okay, good morning, everyone. I am Carlos Afonso from Instituto Nupef in Rio de Janeiro, uh, the proposer of this session. And uh, um, I am one of the two moderators. The other is uh, Christine Hepers from nick.br. Uh, and uh, uh, our title is, is state-led interference in encrypted systems, a public debate on different policy approaches. I hope you all agree with the title. <laughs> and uh, I would like to pass on to Christine so she can present our panel, okay? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I hope we get more people through the line the room will be with more people. Um, I, as uh, Carlos Afonso said, I work at uh, CERT Brazil and NIC, NIC BR. And I would like to introduce our panel and explain a little bit about some rules that we put on. And really, uh, our main goal is to have as many people to participate and have time for uh, you in the audience to be able to interact with the panel and the panel to interact with each other. But I'm going to just uh, present, we will have in the beginning uh, two presentations about policy approaches. And uh, one will be by uh, Eleanor Buxton from the Foreign Office of, um, she is the Foreign Office Specialist on International Cybersecurity Internet Policy in UK. And as part of this office, she provides advice and analysis to inform uh, policy on internet related issues. And uh, the other presenter, will be Nina Janssen, and uh, she's a senior policy officer at the Ministry of Security and Justice in the Netherlands. And she um, uh, is a specialist in international law, especially humanitarian law and criminal law. And our this uh, two presentations will be 10 minutes each, and this is really to seed the discussion about state-led policies in cryptography. And we have a panel uh, with people from different backgrounds and bringing their own perspectives into uh, the issue. Uh, in your far right, I will start naming them, is Christoph Stack. See, he is the Director of Public Policy and Internet at Telefonica. Uh, Seth Bouvier, he is uh, a Foreign Affairs officers Officer at the U.S. Department of State. Then we have Demi Gechko, he is the CEO of NIC.PR. Uh, Rihanna Pfefferkorn, uh, she's a cryptography fellow at Stanford Center for Internet Society. And then we have Stelle Maas, she's a senior policy analyst at Access Now. Uh, we have Monica Rossina, she is a public policy manager at Facebook Brazil. We have Neide Oliveira, she is uh, with the Federal Prosecution Office uh, in Brazil. And Sunil Abraham, he is the executive director of the Center for Internet Society India. Uh, and after we have the two 10-minute presentations, we will open for the panel for them to do any remarks or to bring their perspective into policies. Uh, each panelist will have two minutes to talk. And then uh, we will open for the floor and we will always have that timer on top there, marking two minutes for everyone. So it's really because we want to have as many people as possible participating, and the replies will be two minutes each. When we open for questions or comments, we are going to get uh, three at a time, just in the interest of time. So uh, I would like just to give an introduction. Uh, when we proposed this uh, panel, I think this is a topic, cryptography and uh, policy interference or the need to have or not have is a very hot topic today. 
uh, in the internet. It was already touched in some other panels this week. It was very interesting that we were discussing other topics and this came. And uh, I have a technical background. So one of the things that we want to discuss here is really to explore policy options, uh, the reasons for those options, the context, and also to explore the technical issues, the technical difficulties into implementing policies, sometimes impossibilities, try to bring what are consequences of these policies, intentional and, and non-intentional. I think uh, this will be a very nice discussion for us all to have. So I would like to pass the word, could be to, um, oh my God, Eleanor Buxton. So uh, you have 10 minutes to, to present, thank you. Thank you, well, um, thank you very much and good morning everyone. And hopefully I won't take 10 minutes. Um, so I thought what I would first do is just sort of set the scene a little bit in terms of uh, our general position on encryption, uh, talk a little bit about uh, legislation in the UK and where we stand at the moment, and then some of the issues that we face uh, and some of the discussions that we have around these issues. So um, let's be clear, uh, the British government does support strong encryption, despite what the media may tell you frequently. Um, it's incredibly important to protect UK citizens and all citizens from harm online and billions of people use it every day for a range of services from banking to commerce to communications. Um, so that is our position and quite firmly so. Um, it's also really important for protecting vulnerable individuals, whether that's journalists uh, or human rights defenders working in states where there aren't safeguards, there aren't remedies. Uh, where people may try to target them for political purposes. Um, in some cases, we are actually only aware of particular war crimes that have happened because end-to-end -end encryption was used. And uh, my department, the Foreign Office in the UK, um, has actually provided funding uh, to train up people on the use of end-to-end -end encryption overseas for communications. So, and it's also important for our own work. So. Um, we do a number of international negotiations. Uh, WhatsApp is our tool of choice. Um, I'm sure there's some good ones about Brexit that I'm not privy to. Uh, so, you know, there's, uh, so having secure communications through encryption is really, really important to us and to everyone in the country. Um, so that is where we sort of stand. We have uh, particular legislative powers on encryption. So a few years ago, um, we started refreshing our, essentially our surveillance framework. So um, it's called the Investigatory Powers Act. Um, and uh, that actually repeats the powers that we had in our original legislation from 2000, which is uh, referred to as RIPA. And um, under those provisions, um, telecommunications operators only have to provide access to data in the clear where it is necessary to do so to comply with their obligations when served with the relevant warrant, notice, or authorization. So essentially, what the Act allows for, and I'll read it a little bit just so I get the detail right, um, is that we can serve a technical capability notice uh, by the Secretary of State. So that has to be approved um, by an independent uh, judicial commissioner, um, and the purpose of that notice is to make sure that a telecommunications operator maintains the required capabilities to give effect to warrants and notices quickly and securely. Um, and as part of a notice, uh, the Act makes clear that obligations may be imposed on the relevant operator to maintain the capability to remove encryption. Um, we also have secondary legislation which is currently being put before Parliament sort of right now, uh, and those are called technic technical capability regulations. Those set out the precise obligations that such a technical capability notice can impose, um, and that provides <coughs> that an obligation could be imposed to remove encryption or to provide communications in an intelligible form. So it's actually relatively flexible in the way that an operator can comply with that notice. Um, a quick word on uh, enforceability. So those notices are enforceable through civil proceedings um, against a person in the United Kingdom. Overseas, it's a different story. Uh, we aren't able to enforce them in the same way. Uh, only notices that provide for interception and targeted uh, capabilities on communications data, which is the who, when, what, uh, the who, when, what of uh, communications is enforceable overseas. Um, and so we cannot enforce uh, 
a notice on equipment interference, which is also often, which is our sort of terminology for how we would talk about uh, lawful hacking, I guess, or uh, bulk um, powers overseas. Um, so that notice has to be necessary and proportionate, um, and it must be um, practicable to do so. So um, the government has to consider what steps are reasonably practicable for an individual telecom telecommunications operator, and that has to take into account a range of factors, including the cost to the operator of complying with that notice and the technical feasibility. So any decision on that front has to have regards to particular circumstances of the case, recognizing that there are many different models of encryption and what might be practical for, for one operator may not necessarily be for another. So that, in a sum, is our sort of legal power on encryption. And actually, if you think about it in detail, it is relatively limited. Um, and especially when you get down into the detail of what reasonably practical or technically feasible means, um, it's not clear quite how far it can go. And in some cases, we haven't actually tested it properly yet. Um, I mean, obviously, we continue to face difficulties. So I think, as my colleague from the Netherlands will say, you know, this is a challenge for us. The fact that more and more communications are end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, where even the provider does not have sight of the communications and the provider cannot comply with a lawful order when it has been authorized independently, is a real challenge for us. Um, and it's a real challenge for our agencies. You know, we've faced a number of terrorist attacks this year. Uh, the, one of the most recent ones was outside my house while my flatmate was walking onto the platform and the train exploded. So there, it is, there is a genuine threat here that we need to be able to deal with. And we need to be able to stop terrorist attack planning where we can. That doesn't mean that these services are going to be used in all these attacks, but there may be instances in which they, in which they are. And it is frustrating immensely for our agencies and for law enforcement um, to, for companies to not be able to comply with lawful orders. We, want, we think at the end of the day, we don't want to have unfettered access to all communications, but we need to ensure that people have lawful access to communications that they need to keep us safe. And, those, and that access should be targeted and should be specific. And so we want to work with companies uh, to fulfill our collective responsibility uh, to protect us uh, from terrorists and those who commit serious crimes while crucially allowing providers to protect user privacy. As I said at the beginning, that is really important to us. We rely on these communications just as much as everyone else. So, you know, this is not about creating backdoors, whatever that means. It's a really unhelpful term. Uh, or banning encryption. So um, you'll have seen, you may well have seen if you follow anything around UK politics, that you'll see our ministers going out and talking to companies in California. Uh, the Prime Minister will talk about this quite a lot. Um, we think that a mature dialogue between government and industry on this issue is crucial. Um, and we want people to live up to their responsibilities. Frankly, you know, companies shouldn't want their services to be used by people to plan terrorist attacks. Um, and so we want to understand, better understand, the decisions that companies have made while implementing encryption within their services. And that's kind of where we are at the moment. This is an ongoing problem. Uh, lots of our international counterparts have recognized the same issues. Uh, you know, obviously the US tried to litigate Apple FBI. Um, other countries like Germany and France have um, approached the European Commission with the suggestion for legislation. Um, but I think we recognize that this is a very difficult issue to sort of roll back the tide. And so working with companies is our primary route at the moment. Of course, there's issues around open source technology. So, you know, it would be silly to say that uh, Apple controls the, the spread of encryption in the world, which simply obviously isn't true. You know, your average terrorist can design their own end-to-end -end encrypted app um, pretty swiftly. And we recognize that. Um, and obviously there's only so much that you can actually do about that because that information is out there, the technology is out there, um, and that is not something that government can control. Um, but we can work with these companies. Um, they and their services are used by terrorists in some circumstances, um, and so that is why we are sort of aiming our efforts at them. But please do not think that that is where our, our sort of only evidence base comes from or that we think that that, is the, that will solve this as a problem. We're not really looking at this as a problem to be fixed. 
but what we're asking for is you know how we can work with companies to identify what can be done in an effective way that does respect uh, users rights privacy and does re continue to respect human rights I think you know overall the UK's approach on, well, my job essentially is to make sure that what we're doing domestically uh, matches up with what we say internationally. Um, internationally, we're signed up to, um, we co-sponsored the 2012 resolution on the promotion, protection and enjoyment of human rights online. We've done so for all sort of subsequent versions. We signed up last year to the German and Brazilian resolution on the protection of privacy in the digital age. You know, we do genuinely endorse those uh, endorse those resolutions and we do support them because we recognize that the encroachment on privacy is something that is happening worldwide and we need to continue to protect them. However, how we reconcile that, and I don't want to use the word balance because I don't think that's appropriate in this context, but how we reconcile the need to keep people safe with the need to protect human rights is an ongoing issue and is one that we will continue dialogue with companies, with civil society groups and with individuals on to make sure that we are getting to the right conclusion. Thank you very much. Nina, you have the, the floor. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. First of all, apologies for my voice. I, um, I have some, uh, uh, some uh, cough, so uh, maybe uh, sometimes I go a bit back. Um, thanks for the invitation. We're glad with this opportunity to share uh, with you our national position my experiences and the dilemmas that we encountered in uh, the process of um, defining our national position um, and uh, yeah, uh, with regard to the many beautiful, positive, uh, but definitely also challenging aspects of uh, cryptography. Um, I just, uh, as, a, as a short start with the final outcome, the Netherlands does find that at this point in time, it's not desirable to take any restrictive legal measures as regards to development, availability, and use of encryption in the Netherlands. Um, we've been promoting this position, um, for example, in EU settings. However, what I want to do now is more take you along in the process uh, which led to this position. Why? Because I think that, um, uh, in my opinion, it shows how a multi-stakeholder platform or process may feed into policy processes. In our case, it was more of a national multi-stakeholder process, but um, the IGF is one uh, other example of that, even though the policy process itself was government only for very good reasons. Um, for the last five years, uh, developments in cryptography have been mentioned in our annual cyber assessments. We are a national cybersecurity center, publishes an annual cybersecurity assessment, which is drafted with over 140 partners from law enforcement, uh, academia, security companies, intelligence. Uh, and the fact that encryption uh, was featured in these assessments uh, reflected a sort of duality. On the one hand, the IT security practitioners that favor a very strong encryption um, for the protection of, an of the integrity of information and systems, whereas law enforcement indicated that the same encryption kept them from arresting criminals, both cyber criminals as well as regular criminals. So in 2015, we decided we wanted to draft a policy paper in which the dilemmas around um, encryption were described and which provide the opportunity for a political position to be determined. And we started an interministerial consultation process that involved um, almost all ministries, but definitely economic affairs, justice and security, which includes cyber crime department, uh, internal affairs, which includes the Human Rights Division, the Constitution Division, uh, Intelligence Services, Law Enforcement, uh, Defense and Foreign Affairs. And we try to remain as concise as possible, uh, but in the process we really wanted to spin out the details, the consequences of all policy options, so it took us over six months to basically um, reach the final uh, uh, position. Uh, we didn't have to start from scratch because several departments, of course, had already had cases, incidents, and made certain policy choices. Uh, the first dilemma was one which I just uh, explained. What do we, to what extent do we involve private sector and civil society in this process? We did want to develop a free internal dialogue in which the necessary confidential information could be shared as well. Uh, for example, on methods, on the information that you want, um, on investigation techniques, so that was the reason that we decided this should be a government-only process. 
and it resulted in a formal position on 4 January uh, 2016, and this paper is translated in English, so you can find it on the website of our uh, National Cyber Security Center. Um, so what dilemmas did we encounter, and what, what did we spin out? Um, as Eleanor actually said, uh, in our opinion as well, it's, it, the balancing skill is not a very good analogy. Most of the times, the interests that are involved uh, can be met both at the same time, uh, but it, yeah, sometimes is useful to use uh, uh, at least sort of a, um, um, an indication of what different interests and what, what struggles do you encounter to use uh, the, 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 the dilemmas. Um, so encryption is important for the economic growth and innovation. It offers protection of human rights, secure information flow. It is necessary for privacy, confidentiality of communication, and for cybersecurity. However, at the same time, also the Netherlands experiences serious problems in law enforcement and intelligence gathering due to encryption. So one of the dilemmas sometimes called security versus security being uh, cybersecurity of systems, data protection, forms of these are forms of uh, public and national security where the incentive would be to use as strong cryptography as possible. Uh, whenever large-scale cyber attacks or data breaches take place, this may cripple society and essential processes come to a halt. So uh, these are forms of public and national security. On the other hand, law enforcement, counterterrorism, legitimate intelligence gathering, also forms of public and national security where the incentive is actually to try and break encryption in order to analyze the data from criminals, from terrorists, to gather intelligence uh, on foreign and digital espionage, on military opponents, therefore called sort of dilemma security versus or security and security. Another dilemma which is um, both <coughs> security uh, versus security as well as privacy versus security, the protection of personal information, uh, to be able to freely express oneself, communicate freely, enjoy one's privacy, to be able to do objective journalism, um, also the need to protect state secrets, company secrets, the need for government to protect the communication with its citizens in an e-government society, uh, to communicate internally in a secure way, for example, for diplomacy or military, um, and the need for companies to store their data securely, to ensure backups, devices are safe, to protect their innovations. Cryptography really provides necessary security for the protection of this information, for the protection of this privacy, for the protection of this personal information and communication. The same persons and organizations may also actually really want the state to protect their personal security when they fall victim to a crime or worse, to a terrorist attack. Uh, companies that do report IPR infringements or stolen company secrets, they want law enforcement to investigate and prosecute, to have access to the necessary information, to have the powers and resources available to investigation, intelligence, and security services, that they are suited for the current and future digital reality with effective access to that information. Uh, in addition, the human rights that are mentioned, they are not uh, absolute as such. The restrictions are allowed as long as they meet the requirements of Constitution, the European Charter, the Convention on Human Rights. Infringements are allowed if it serves a legitimate purpose, regulated by law, foreseeable, unknown, proportionate, and necessary. With that in mind, um, we did look at the means and the possibilities for government to ensure that the interests are met. So what can you regulate, regulate, to what extent can you mitigate the negative consequences with or without formal regulation, what should it, this regulation look like, what distinctive forms of encryption do you have and can actually be managed in a way uh, by regulation. A decryption order, for example, would only be effective uh, for a service provider, would only be effective if it uh, actually has a decryption key or owns the cryptography. Um, and what alternative options do you have that can work around encryption in, in, uh, instead of uh, weakening it in a general sense. Um, and in our position, there are currently no <coughs> options in a general sense, for example, via standards uh, to weaken encryption products without compromising the security of digital systems that use encryption. For instance, uh, introducing a technical access into an encryption product would make it impossible for investigation services to uh, inspect the encrypted files, but of course, digital systems become vulnerable to criminals, terrorists, foreign intelligence services just as well. So that's 
why we're of the opinion that at this point in time it's not desirable to take any restrictive legal measures as regards to development, availability, and use of encryption. We do find it really important to work uh, for ways around this, so we want to continue the dialogue with the providers uh, within government to find ways to get to the relevant encrypted information by means of policy or operational uh, methods, uh, by using each other's expertise and networks, for example, in the context with uh, service providers, over-the-top players, uh, in streamlining legal assistance procedures, in ways to get into devices before data is encrypted, obviously with the necessary safeguards, checks and oversight, uh, and a legal regulation to meet those um, uh, competences. Now, the organizers also asked me to shortly uh, reflect a little bit on the European developments in this regard. Encryption has been a topic for discussion in several council formats. Commission has um, uh, raised uh, the issue in several different formats. And it's basically the same dilemmas were, uh, uh, which we were confronted with on a national level were um, played out on the European level as well. Uh, there are currently several initiatives being developed. They're not finalized yet, mostly. So uh, there are legislative proposals in regard to e-privacy, data protection, e-evidence, law enforcement, as well as policy proposals for dialogue with platforms, for example, on counterterrorism, countering recruitment, um, or operational solutions such as training for law enforcement and sharing of best practices. Uh, for law enforcement uh, to work around uh, encrypted information. So with that, I hope to have given you some insight into how the process um, in the Netherlands went, what dilemmas we touched upon, and obviously, as Eleanor said, this is not the end. We will be uh, meeting different and new challenges as cryptography develops further, as our, the digitalization of our society develops further, as legislation needs to be updated, um, and we... Uh, yeah, we will have new ta challenges to come over, and uh, um, uh, that's why I hope also to hear some interesting views from the floor. Yesterday um, uh, uh, afternoon, for example, um, uh, we attended an, uh, I attended a very nice interactive session by GP Digital, where they, we were invited to think about the actual uh, policies that are both human rights respecting and at the same time very effective. Um, and it led to a discussion on um, how you can be engaged in national policy processes. So I would like to hear from you how you are engaging your national processes or, uh, for example, the safeguards that you have promoted nationally and in how you work around that. So it will be interesting to hear. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think it was uh, very interesting to see the, these policies. For the people that were in line and didn't, were not able to arrive in the very beginning. I'm just going to refresh uh, the, format of the, the format of the panel. We just had a presentation of two policy uh, options and, and how countries are, uh, what they're considering and what are the dilemmas uh, setting policy. We are going to open for the panel if they want to make any remarks, any other comments about the, these questions, two minutes. Uh, for each person, then we're going to open for the floor and we're going to be with some timekeeping of two minutes for every intervention because we want actually to have as much interaction as possible here. So uh, I'd like to open for the panel if anyone would like to make remarks. We're gon not going to call people by names and saying you have to say, but if nobody volunteers, we can actually just ask someone to say something. So anyone would like to go first? So. Please. So, so in preparation for this uh, panel, I listed on my notebook uh, nine different uh, policy options that governments could take. Uh, sometimes they're distinct from each other, sometimes they're overlapping. And the two uh, presentations that we've heard have covered uh, s several of them, so I'm going to go quickly through the ones that haven't been covered. In uh, the developing world, people are still talking about prohibitions, not so much prohibitions of encryption, but prohibitions on certain standards and prohibitions on key length. Uh, the old uh, debate around key escrow still exists. Uh, some governments are able to go to standard setting organizations with large armies of mathematicians and uh, compromise encryption standards while they're being developed under public scrutiny. 
the next thing is that uh, some, some governments also go to standard setting organizations like the IETF and ISO and through the uh, process of consensus building block the development of uh, strong encryption standards. For example, uh, TRS 1.3 is an example of that type of thing. Um, but then I also wanted to talk about two kind of positive uh, policy options which I would like to see, a kind of positive interference by governments, uh, especially, again, from India. The first is requiring government officers to use encryption, uh, both in order to keep uh, 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 communications confidential, but also for non-repudiation purposes. And finally, uh, investing heavily in education research and development around mathematics and uh, cryptography. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for raising these important points. Monica, do you want to go? Thank you so much for um, having me on this panel. Interfering. <laughs> um, it is an honor to represent Facebook um, at this panel. Um, I just have a few uh, words to say. Um, at Facebook, strong encryption serves a vital role in securing our infrastructure and protecting our users' personal data and communications. When Facebook uses encryption, the objective is not to frustrate law enforcement, but rather to uh, create secure networks that protect our users. It is our position that deliberately um, introducing flaws in encryption technology substantially under undermine cybersecurity as a whole, it, because it is not technologically possible to make it easier for law enforcement to access encrypted content communications without making it easier for cyber criminals and foreign governments to do so as well. Um, in light of the recent uh, high profile data, data breaches, this issue becomes, of course, particularly uh, salient. Um, internet platform providers and mobile app developers that are subject to backdoor requirements or other restrictions on the use of encryption technology will be at a significant competitive disadvantage relative to their foreign counterparts that can continue to offer unencumbered products, substantially harming domestic industry and economic growth opportunities. Um, one trend that we have been able to see um, is that one, when one app or service is blocked, many users will simply switch uh, either temporarily or permanently to a readily available alternative. In the case of uh, the Brazil WhatsApp blocking case, many users temporarily switch to uh, Telegram. Um, like I said, this not only artificially undermines competition, but in many cases, alternative services located in other jurisdictions may either be unable or in many times unwilling to cooperate with governments. Having said that, I would just like to highlight that there is no place on Facebook for terrorism or child exploitation. Um, Facebook is responsive to law enforcement requests and uh, complies with applicable laws. And that includes uh, closing accounts when we receive uh, credible reports of criminal activity, providing training to law enforcement officials on our platform policies and, and practices. We have recently been doing that in Brazil a lot. Um, and disclosing unencrypted user information and all the metadata that we're able to provide uh, in response to valid uh, law enforcement requirements. Um, we're eager to continue to work in partnerships with key stakeholders on these important issues. We deeply respect uh, law enforcement's ability to um, work and keep our community secure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is another good point, and I think the points about metadata is something that usually is not discussed. Like as uh, Eleanor said, criminals can quickly go to uh, develop their own crypto and then you lose metadata also in that in those cases. So it's some of the issues that need to be raised too. So I'm going to pass to Nady from the Federal Prosecutor Office in Brazil. Thank you, Christina. Good morning for all. 
Initially, I intended to demystify the idea that many people have among providers, lawyers, and academics that the Brazilian prosecution service is against cryptography. That could be more wrong. End-to-end -end data encryption, for instance, was already being used by the Federal Prosecution Serve long before it was adopted by WhatsApp, for instance, that is the most uh, used app in Brazil. Every good citizen has the right to have his or her data encrypted, regardless of the service used, for the security of the data and of the exchange message. This does not mean that people who commit crimes by means of encrypted servers should be immune fro from their acts. Therefore, we understand that the providers that use any type of cryptography in cooperation with the law enforcement authorities must together seek the safest manner without affecting the other users of allowing the investigation of those who are misusing their service. Uh, in this discussion about cryptography, what matters to the persecution service is to determine to what extent an internet application provider which operates in the country may cooperate with the public authorities in order to unravel and prevent the commission of crimes and violation of rights conducted to that effect possible and precise technical modifications if they are needed. Thank you so much for giving this perspective. So this side of the panel talked a lot, so this side is the more talkative, so later on. So I don't know, let's see if you can, it's because this one is making the whole okay. phone noise. Can you hold, hear me? Let's go for the plan okay. B, that's the other microphone. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to start by quoting a letter that was signed by more than 80 organizations, including Access Now, which was sent to the ministries ahead of the Five Eyes ministerial meeting of this summer in Ottawa, which says that, while the challenges of modern day security are real, proposal to undermine encryption threatens the integrity and security of communications, tools that are relied upon by for international commerce, banking, the free press, government, human rights advocates, and individuals around the world. In short, encryption is key for security, key for the economy, and key for human rights, which is why any proposal to weaken or undermine encryption must be rejected. When we're talking about workarounds to encryption, I think it's important to look back at different approaches that governments have taken over the past decades in order to gather data. For many years, we saw the need argued by government for broad and indiscriminate data retention mandate. Those mandates have been found disproportionate twice by the European Court of Justice. At global level, MLAT were created and used to allow authorities around the world to exchange information. These mechanisms have however been found slowed and burdensome, but rather than focusing on upgrading those mechanisms, we're seeing a growth and a rise of proposal from governments in increasing, increasingly focusing in government hacking. This has profound implication for human rights. We have seen this discussion happening also in the EU context, in the ongoing debate on the so-called access to e-evidence debate. I'd like to point out that in this race to gather data, we often qualify very quickly all of these data are evidence even before they've been accessed and can be qualified as such. Access Now has published a report on human rights response to government hacking in which we call for a global presentive ban on hacking. We also recognize that several governments are already engaging in these practices for intelligence gathering, and we've put forward a series of safeguards, including vulnerability disclosures, due process and oversight, that must be in place in the rare instances where government hacking could be justified. To conclude, I just want to say that most types of government-sponsored hacking are currently inherently inconsistent with human rights, and these risks are amplified by the lack of public debate in this issue. So I would like to thank the UK and the Dutch government for being here today and engaging in this discussion. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So, you know there? So, Rihanna, just jump in. Thank you. Sure, okay. So we're going, I guess we're going down the line <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about responsibility. Um, 
I think the UK's outlook on the encryption debate is very similar to the one in the United States, at least as we hear from federal officials in the United States, in terms of how they frame the discussion. Um, Eleanor talked about companies living up to their responsibilities, but she didn't really specify necessarily what she views those responsibilities as being. Um, responsibility is not a term that exists in a vacuum. You have to be responsible to somebody or to something. And I take it from her comments that she views technology companies in Silicon Valley, where I come from, as being responsible to serving the aims of government in terms of maintaining uh, access capabilities for law enforcement. But it's also an interest of tech companies to be responsible to their users, to be responsible to <coughs> the broader information security ecosystem, to innovation and, and new systems and development, and to the future. And I think that's something that we heard much more from uh, Nina with regard to the outlook of the Dutch government, where it really sounds like the Dutch government views itself as being responsible to its citizens and to the future prosperity and uh, you know thriving of the Dutch economy and Dutch society and of being responsible for protecting crit critical infrastructure, of protecting IP, um, and protecting individuals' rights to communicate anonymously uh, and to their privacy. And so I think we also heard a lot about responsibility to include uh, various stakeholders in determining what the state's policy should be in the Netherlands. And so I think that's a really noteworthy uh, compare and contrast that we could take in terms of thinking about what role governments have in terms of setting uh, their encryption policy, which way responsibility flows, among whom, and what the role of the state should be. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you very much. Demi, if you would like to go. Okay. First of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm not uh, of any particular government. I'm in the private sector. And related more to the internet, then I will <coughs> uh, say some thoughts about the, the issue without any relation to any government by the full. Uh, first of all, I think it's a, a right of anyone to use encryption. I think it's different the, the encryption that the individuals choose to use and the individuals, the, 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 the encryption that is provided by platforms. There are two different things, but of course I think you have the right to use encryption on the whole way. I think also that uh, a weak encryption is uh, worse than no encryption at all because the, the weak encryption will give you a, a sensation, a, 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 a feeling of, of security that is not true and you will feel secure and, and when the right uh, you are not secure anymore. Then I am totally in favor of the, the strong security. And uh, as a, a last thought, ju just to, to mention that the, the internet in some way uh, tries to defend itself all the time. We don't have heard uh, uh, about encryption years ago uh, as much as we are hearing now uh, because of the Snowden thing, because of the, the breach in privacy and so. Then every time we, we aim some kind of, of goal and aim this goal in a bad way, we uh, open the way from, from the opposite uh, uh, process then if you begin to violate privacy through the uh, uh, tools to, to <coughs> get the navigation data of the users, they will use uh, a browser without uh, this kind of things, like, like Tor, for example. If you try to get the, the search data, the user will try to use uh, DuckDuckGo or other uh, uh, softwares. If you try to, to read the email, the user, of course, will be using uh, cryptography and this is uh, uh, the natural way to go forward. And in some way, I, I just want to warn that if you take, if we take the, the wrong measures, the, the, these measures will lead us to the wrong uh, 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 objective, the wrong, wrong goal. Then, of course, I am totally in favor of strong cryptography. I think it's in, in our uh, uh, total right to use this, to provide protection to our privacy, and you have to avoid the false dilemma of privacy versus security. This is, of course, a false dilemma, and you have to, to uh, be aware of. Thank you. Thank you, Demi. I'll just uh, give a note, like, um, here in the table, the microphones don't move. The speakers cannot get closer to the microphone. I was a panelist, I felt this, but if you use the 
translator in English, it amplifies. So if anyone is having problem hearing the the small devices is working. So, uh, Seth. Hi, yeah, I'm Seth Bouvier from the U.S. State Department. Um, I just wanted to say at the beginning that unlike the the Dutch and the, the U.K. governments, I'm not here to present a national position, um, but rather speaking from for someone who's been involved in encryption debates from inside for many years. Um, obviously, if you follow um, this issue in the U.S., you'll know that, that the issue of encryption has has flared up um, several times over the last few years, um, and I think the, the policy debates at the government level played out rather publicly. Um, you have law enforcement, public safety officials um, making their um, problems known publicly, um, and, um, but, but we have a new administration now and they've not put anything out, so, so I'm here um, to, um, to hear from you and to have this conversation with this, with this group about the issues um, that are important. Um, I'm not going to. I don't have much time, so I'm not going to go over um, some of the some of the um, strong interests that uh, Nina and Eleanor have um, put out there. Um, the U.S. certainly shares those strong interests um, in strong encryption for the same reasons: uh, for cybersecurity, for protecting human rights, for protecting our own government information. Um, we have those those same. So I won't I won't go over that. I did want to add maybe a couple of issues to um, to the to the queue for people to think about. Um, the conversation about the risks have focused mostly on kind of end-to-end -end and sort of encrypted platforms being used by terrorists and criminals, but um, there's this issue, um, I think that's um, sort of framed a lot of the debate in the United States about device encryption, and so you have um, devices that are encrypted that are, you know, are in the lawful possession of um, the FBI or other investigative groups, but they, they can't get access to it for their own purposes, and so, um, you know, discussing the issues, um, device encryption end to end, are there differences? Um, sort of be curious to hear about that. Um, final seconds. I guess I just wanted to raise one other issue, which is, um, I think, not usually part of the discussion, but interoperability. I think, um, you know, you <coughs> potentially have different national approaches <coughs> to this issue, and sort of, you know, I think at the international level, I think it's worth considering interoperability and sort of how these different approaches might fit together, um, and is there, is there some solution that, that could work there? So um, I'm out of time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing the point of interoperability. I think this is key for internet. It works until now because we have interoperability. So Christoph, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I work for a company which is offering communication for 90 years now. So. And I hear from people I have not been around that for 90 years we have to give lawful intercept to this communication. And I think over these 90 years we have developed in many, um, I think around the world, systems to be able to give access to uh, information in specific cases to authorities, to the governments. Um, I understand that now we have uh, separated the service of communication from the infrastructure, which is nice, which is good, which we all like, and we support. Uh, we also support that our customers can encrypt information because basically um, uh, we are, of course, uh, in favor of their privacy and of their human rights. At the same time, we understand that, and we will also continue to give access to, um, <laughs> because we have to, because we're obliged by law, to give access in specific cases in the right circumstances with the right lawful process to um, communication of our customers. At the same time, what we can hand over is scrambled information. It's encrypted information. It makes no sense to the authorities, okay? So that's the issue. So my question would be, is that a technology issue as it's very often discussed, or is it rather a public policy issue? I think it's a public policy issue because in the end, I don't understand why the values and the decisions we have taken between very important human rights have changed over the last years. I think the values are still the same. So I would rather ask um, if there's no way of giving um, uh, if unrecoverable encryption, which is a very uh, specific form of encryption, is the way you want to go forward, how can we strike this right balance between these kind of fundamental rights and, uh, and, and basically value decisions we've taken in the past? And I think that's basically where I see that the both governments who present the beginning are very close to each other. I mean, uh, just that one government says, uh, we believe that we still have to strive for that, even for encrypted information. And the other government says, we believe we cannot strive for it because technically this will make the whole system unsustainable. The problem is that then, if I understand correctly, the Dutch government says very cleverly, well, I mean, we, we leave encryption as it is, but we still want access to the information. So 
they just look for a different way of hacking the device or hacking whatever. I mean, I use hacking and, and a bad word maybe, but I mean, basically getting access to the information in a different way. If that's safer from a <laughs> technology point of view, I mean, fantastic. But I mean, then the debate should be maybe in the next IGF, in what circumstances can they get access to this information in a different way without opening encryption. I think that in the end it's a public policy debate and we will come up to the end that there needs to be in certain circumstances access by governments to um, communication because there always have been in history and this will not change through encryption. Okay, I think that we are going to open for the floor but I think Eleanor just wants to clarify a point so. Yeah, I think just to be clear, I think the Dutch and I actually have the same position. We've probably just expressed it slightly differently, which is that I think, you know, we take, we're not trying to undermine or the UK government is not trying to undermine or weaken encryption. Again, it's looking for are there workarounds which are feasible um, and are there alternatives which are feasible? And, I, and so I think we're actually probably on the same page as opposed to having any distinct policy position. Um, so, so just to correct that point. Um, I mean, I think, uh, and on Rihanna's point about, you know, we think that companies have a responsibility to serving the aims of government by providing access. I'm not sure that's quite right. I think we think, we, we think companies have a responsibility to innovation their, to their users and to critical infrastructure just as much. Um, but if we serve a company with a lawful warrant, which has been independently authorized, and they provide services to our citizens, we would expect that they should be able to follow through. But we recognize that actually they can't in a lot of circumstances. And it is frustrating. I mean, that, that is just a challenge. And what do you do in that sort of circumstance? But what you do in that circumstance does not involve uh, you know, forcing someone to weaken or, or undermine encryption, because that simply isn't within our legal framework. So we're not able to do that. Um, so I think, again, you know, and, and just to clarify on the process as well, so our Investigatory Powers Act, our new legislation, um, that went through, there were three independent reviews which led to the drafting of that. That was then scrutinized by three parliamentary committees. It went through two houses of parliament uh, and was voted upon by democratically elected representatives. And throughout that process, um, uh, throughout that process, civil society, academia, uh, scientists, um, other governments could feed in information, technology companies could, everyone could provide evidence. We took extensive calls for evidence throughout the, throughout the process. So we have tried to strive for a framework which at least people could contribute to and could actually capture the views of many rather than having a purely government dictated approach. So just to clarify that, I think Nina framed her presentation much better than I did. <laughs> um, but I think we're actually largely more on the same page um, than it may have come across. Thank you. So there's one question here, one there and one there, the three first. So. Hello, uh, thank you for the really interesting discussion so far. My name is Joanna Bryson. I'm a reader in artificial intelligence at the University of Bath. And uh, I want to say, first of all, it's a statement and a question. You cannot trust AI if you cannot trust encryption. So think in particular about driverless trucks and how you're going to stop them if state actors can hack into a driverless truck driving through a city. We've all seen this in Europe. Um, I, I'm very worried how many people here have degrees in computer science. I understand that those coming from political science backgrounds are used to looking for negotiated solutions. But, and I am not an expert in encryption, I'm an expert in artificial intelligence from a psychology background, but I have enough computer science degrees to doubt that there is a technical solution to this. And I realize that historically government has always had access to communication, but I'm not sure we can still do that. The world is changing. So I, I, I want to know, I mean, yes, maybe you can go and, and look at the people themselves and try to get information from them. But I'm not sure you can, there is a technical way to do the two things that you want. And I, I would like, I hope somebody else with a computer science degree says something uh, to this meeting. Uh, there's a second one there. Uh, my name is Ted Hardy. I'm a longtime participant in the ITF and I wanted to make a clarification to the uh, intervention that Mr. Abraham made. Uh, he mentioned that he thought that uh, governments had blocked the development of strong encryption in SDOs, including the ITF, and related that uh, to the development of TLS 1.3. Uh, I, I can clarify for him that that's absolutely not the case. Governments have no specific uh, role in the development of standards in the ITF, and the ITF has historically had a very long uh, support for the development of cryptography and the, and the deployment of same. 
going back to RFC 1984, uh, yes, that was well chosen in 1996, um, the straight statement on cryptography and technology and the internet, uh, RFC 2804, the ITF policy that it will not develop technology for wiretapping, um, a later statement by the IAB um, on internet confidentiality in response to pervasive surveillance saying the internet should move from permitting confidential communication uh, to making it the default, and finally RFC 7624, uh, which is a threat model document which describes it. Uh, in essence, the ITF has made a very strong commitment to both the development of technologies which support cryptographic solutions. And I, as a participant, I also want to remind you of a very fundamental aspect of the Internet's um, architecture, and that is uh, while there are telecommunications providers who provide services to the Internet, that service is the movement of packets from one end to the other. Uh, <clears throat> there are other kinds of application services in the Internet, and those can provide peer-to-peer -peer communications or they can provide communications through a server. When you have peer-to-peer -peer communications which are encrypted, there is no provider to serve such a warrant to. Uh, the only person you can go to and ask for the clear text is one endpoint or the other. And in fact, we are making strides to make it possible to make things which formerly required a, a server to be able to use end-to-end uh, -end encryption even in conference situations which are multi-party. So I believe that from the architectural perspective, continuing to focus on service providers is fundamentally flawed. Thank you. Thank you very much. The third one there. Um, I'm Clément Perarno from University Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Right now there are discussions at the European level with regard, with regard to export, export, export control list sorry, for dual use items. And there is a proposal in the air of removing encryption products from uh, this control list, and I would like to have your views on, on this issue. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to open for anyone that wants to reply, and I would just want to, uh, we are going to take questions three and three. So three comments, then three again. Uh, I would just put, take off my hat as moderator and put my hat as someone with a computer science degree and PhD. And I just wanted to comment that I agree that I don't see a way to have a compromise on this. So I don't see a way to have a compromise on uh, being able to serve and being able to have strong end-to-end -end encryption and, and being able to have this. So uh, you always have can have a shift, you can have someone building someone another app. So it's complicated and I think to having this technical views here and have this debate, I think it's important. I think it's important because because we that are technical, we need to understand more the policy issues, but I think we are living in a new world. Uh, like the gentleman said, we have an architecture that works in a certain way. So I think we need to discuss a lot and deeply with the technical community in the feasibility of doing that and, and everything else. So. Uh, I think you want to respond to, to the comment, yeah, that was raised specifically to him, and then Christoph has a comment too. So, so I'd like to start with the comment about um, that you can only get the decrypted payload if you go to the endpoint. If you look at the technical documentation for WhatsApp, there is something called a data vault, and uh, uh, the encrypted material is kept in the data vault. What, what, what Facebook doesn't make clear is for how long it is kept in the data vault. So there is retention of the encrypted data going on. Going on. When it comes to government participation at the IETF, it's not just what uh, the representatives of that particular government say at the mic. Uh, of course, that has some kind of influence on what the rest of the room thinks. Uh, the call for the hum has still not happened on TLS 1.3. But if that government has sufficient resources, that government can fund the participation of several academics and mathematicians that perhaps uh, support their point of view and that can interfere with the so-called hum methodology of deciding which way uh, things go. And when it comes to the question about the compromise, uh, when uh, either free software uh, communities or uh, proprietary companies implement a particular standard, they may introduce vulnerabilities. And that is what governments are taking advantage of when they have a legal hacking uh, program. Christoph, you raise your hand. I mean, just coming back to the technology and, and, and policy aspect. I mean, I, I think we, we, 
I heard no one in this whole panel um, saying that there should not be a world in which encryption is happening. I think everyone said that. So actually, I don't see this kind of problem, which is coming up all the time, that you cannot have a, a kind of balance or a compromise between two things. I think there will be an encrypted world. People will use encryption, and they have a right to use it. That's fantastic. The only thing I said, and I think many people said here on the panel in different words, is that encryption is a very nice tool to help with privacy, but it's not sufficient to give you privacy. And it's also not sufficient to help with the with the overall question of uh, when can a government, for example, have access to certain information or not. Um, I think what's currently developing is that people say, okay, encryption, we cannot stop it anyway, and it's going to happen anyway, and it's good, by the way, and it's necessary maybe for, for the future world we go to. At the same time, this does not mean that you will not find other ways to give um, authorities in reasonable and proportional cases access to information. The only question I put out, and maybe it was not clear enough, is, I am not sure, and I don't know uh, enough about that, if that's a better way or worse way from technology point of view. Okay, so is giving legal hacking of devices to governments, which is basically a solution currently, um, is that a better way from a technology point of view, um, or is it a worse, um, a, a worse position? Because I think that's the debate currently, honestly. I mean, it's not that we debate if encryption will happen or not, it will happen anyway. Before we go back, anyone else from the panel wants to comment something? Oh, there's uh, here. Um, I'd like to react on the export control question. Um, we would support encryption being removed from the list, indeed, and um, but we would like the reform to go a little bit beyond that and uh, are asking for more commitment on transparency in the licensing and more um, commitment for human rights to be also included in the framework. We're seeing some positive movement from the European Parliament on that front, but of course now, uh, as discussion moves into the Council, uh, we will be looking very closely to get um, to get those commitments into it. Okay. Uh, we had one hand, second and third here, so he was also, you can. Um, my name is Ji Hao Jun, a MEG member from China. Mm, obviously, um, encryption have its benefits, but also comes with new risks, for example, um, you know, on the internet, uh, encryption softwares are wider, uh, free, free software are widely available. Could such kind of tools, be, uh, such, such uh, uh, you know, openly available software to be, a, could it be a new tools to e extract private, uh, you know, personal data from the users? And uh, also we have to balance um, the benefit of protecting human rights, privacy, and uh, uh, um, uh, commercial and in industrial uh, property uh, rights, uh, and uh, you know the need to to combat terrorism, crack down on uh, uh, crimes online, etc. And from the technical point of view, um, all encrypted uh, data can be decrypted depends on the speed of computing speed of the machine, the, the, the computers, and uh, as the, the, the traditional way of encryption is concerned. Um, but also we have to consider that uh, uh, a new, new method of encryption, for example, quantum encryption is unhackable. When somebody was hacking the uh, quantum encrypted message, the data would be corrupted immediately. Uh, how far are we away from such uh, in, in wide introduction of such new technologies? When such technologies are available to terrorists, how the Homeland Security Agencies uh, work and tackle such problems in the future? Thank you. Thank you, please. Oh, thank you very much, Shisho Kumar from Global Partners Digital. Thank you for this opportunity and to the panelists for their perspectives. The Human Rights Council resolution on the promotion, protection, and enjoyment of human rights on the internet was mentioned on the panel. Um, and I heard that with great interest because at GPD we see there's a clear need for international norm building on this issue because clearly there are different approaches at the national level um, to both policy and to the policy making process. So guidance at the international level is needed, is important, and we believe that guidance should be human rights respecting. 
So I would be interested in hearing from everyone here if they see the new resolution on the promotion, protection, and enjoyment of human rights on the internet as an opportunity, and if there's support for text in the new resolution, which is upcoming in June on the 38th session of the Human Rights Council, which recognizes the important role that encryption plays as an enabler of human rights, and in so use this opportunity to move forward um, international norm building um, to progress in this, on this issue. Thank you. Thanks, um, Ian Brown, um, speaking entirely in a personal capacity here. Um, I, I thank you to the panel. It was really useful to get in really into the detail which you did. Um, that's the benefit of these kind of meetings. I do sometimes get slightly frustrated having worked on encryption policy for over 20 years and being pro professor of it at Oxford University and having a PhD in computer science to hear some of the same sort of tropes coming up um, over and over and again because it means we don't then get the time to get, to get into the nuances which is where the important questions actually come up. I think Rihanna actually made a really good point yesterday relating to the point that was also made by the, the gentleman from Telefonica on the lawful hacking side, we don't have 20 years of experience in public policy debate and evidence to go on, and I, I agree very much with Rihanna. We need to pay a lot of attention to, to that and think through the risks that that, that enables. I, th I think Sunil replied well on the, the IETF point somewhere. I also, I also spent a lot of time as a consultant for the US government. The informal practices sometimes are very different to the admirable formal, many formal statements that the IETF has made on the importance of, of security and, and strong crypto. We learned so much about so many of the ways that governments have been informally dealing with these issues through the, the Snowden disclosures, and there's much evidence of what, of what Sunil mentioned. Um, the, the question I'm interested in, although I'm really sorry, I'm, I want to raise it and I have to run off to another session immediately. Um, there hasn't been much talk yet about the um, large-scale analytics of communications data that Snowden revealed, and I'm, I'm interested particularly from the US panelists how your Section 702 Pfizer enables or does not enable that. The reform is happening right now if, if, if you expect there to be any significant changes. Thank you. Thank you. So I know that there was a question specifically you asked. So uh, Eleanor, then I think probably Seb. So okay, yeah. Um, so just on the resolution point. Um, so I mean, there was a resolution last year uh, uh, that Germany and Brazil sponsored, and um, the text of that said, um, emphasizing that in the digital age, technical solutions to secure and protect the confidentiality of digital communications, including measures for encryption and anonymity can be important to ensure the enjoyment of human rights, in particular the rights to privacy, to freedom of expression, and to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. So in a sense, there is already norm setting going on in this capacity in the Human Rights Council. I assume a similar resolution will come back around uh, in the next session coming up, I guess it's in March. Um, and so I expect that um, you know, encryption is not going away as an issue on which people want to have um, international <coughs> guidance um, and some sort of international norms. Uh, so, and we adopted that resolution ad, as did all the rest of the EU. Um, and um, um, I think just on the sort of compromise, technical feasibility, all those sorts of questions, I mean, people have raised uh, points around the actual implementation of standards. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, we're not complete idiots, um, <laughs> to be frank. Like, we have an awful lot of very, very clever people working on these issues. Um, we have... Um, uh, GCHQ uh, has an enormous amount of technical expertise in it. Um, we wouldn't be pursuing lines that we did not think were actually possible because as much as policy uh, and policymakers without scientific degrees may be the people who sort of write submissions to ministers, those all go through highly technical people on the way up. So um, nothing, we would not propose a measure that we did not actually think was possible. I was saying to Ian earlier, um, you know, none of this makes for good sound bites. Uh, and that's a, real, that's a real challenge with all of this, is that political statements on all of these issues are actually really challenging because, you know, frankly, a lot of people don't understand or they're saying things in, you know, one sentence. This is not something that we can capture in a sentence very easily. Um, so I would just, you know, reinforce that. There are a lot of people working in government across these issues in the UK, the Netherlands, and the US, and everywhere in the world, um, a lot of whom will have and do have the requisite expertise. Those may not be the people who go out and talk about it in public, um, but they are certainly advising on decision-making. Seth, there's yeah, a question uh, for you. So. so thanks for your question, Ian. Um, I wasn't <laughs> expecting a 702 question, so I um, will confess I don't, I don't know the answer. But um, 
the, what I have heard is that I think there's some expectation that the 702 stuff will get done. Um, in, in regards to the specific subject question, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen the language recently, so I think hopefully that gives you some sense. That, but the, you know, I do perceive an urgency around it, so I think it will probably move. Um, since I since I have the mic, um, and I'm happy to follow up with you. Um, um, since I have the mic, though, I guess I, I um, <coughs> would like to sort of put a question out there for everyone to consider. Um, you know, since since I think you've heard from the panelists that. You know, I, don't, I guess, sorry, just to take a back up, step back. I think the question that I would like to see some um, engagement in is sort of around what sort of the general public wants to see in terms of what, what are their expectations for encryption. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's any sense that, you know, people who want to implement strong encryption and do end-to-end -end on, their, on their own, that there's any interest in um, sort of interfering with that. But what's the general public's, um, what are the desires around encryption, right? Is it all or nothing? Um, I mean, I think I have, I, you know, I've heard, I hear a lot from people that, you know, they don't want their photos to get wiped off their phones. Um, so there's sort of that sense. But also there's a trend of ransomware where you have malicious actors coming and encrypting your data. Um, potentially it could be recovered or not. Um, so I think, you know, I think where the debate, what, where there should be more debate is around, around that question. Um, what are actually the, the, the factors driving sort of public interest in, in, in these issues? Um, Thanks. Okay, just uh, we have uh, Nina that wanted to comment. Yeah, I wanted yes. It's on. It's on. I wanted to react to um, uh, two different points. One was that uh, the debate or the discussion that we're having from a policy uh, uh, perspective, uh, the, the focus on the service providers. Um, we do think that it is necessary to stay in touch with the uh, service providers and having a dialogue with them because exactly for, I don't know who exactly in the room mentioned it, but the metadata for law enforcement is still really an important aspect and you don't always need the content to be able to uh, effectively um, uh, uh, investigate and prosecute. Um, so this is definitely a reason you should be uh, and, and remain in dialogue with the uh, service providers. And then there was also um, the questions uh, rela relating to the lawful access to devices and information to work around the encryption. Hardened software will remain vulnerable. There, we are humans, we design it, so we will um, make mistakes with that. And there, uh, are this is a way, this will remain a way to get into <coughs> the data um, that uh, uh, you have New the, the discussion could be whether you use existing vulnerabilities or new vulnerabilities. Those new vulnerabilities will have a definitely a, a another policy discussion related to that, but um, it is a different way and it is a different um, um, yeah, discussion that you have to access the data uh, and work around encryption that way. Uh, Mr. Suner wants a quick qu reply uh, here. I, I just wanted to answer uh, Professor Ian Brown's question uh, around big data analytics, uh, even though he's not in the room anymore. Uh, I think uh, the Dutch government may be taking the leadership here. I don't uh, know for sure, but I've read the report by uh, Professor Dennis Bruders on uh, big data-based uh, uh, policing. So that could be uh, the approach that explains the forbearance in the regulation of crypto because they're now going to go for the big data based uh, policing. Though I, I'm just uh, reading from publicly available documentation, I don't really know. So um, everyone wants to talk now and there are a lot of questions. <laughs> so what would it like that? I'm gonna take the three last questions. There was one back there, one here, and I see one here, and sorry, I was looking everywhere, but time is short. I think this could have been like a big session. So, uh, and then, while almost everyone wants to talk, we can have like a wrap up and answer to both questions here. So there was one back there. You. Hello, my name is Moreno. I'm a cryptography researcher at Inscript Lab at Federal University of Minas Gerais. And I don't see any way of doing this without a backdoor. UK, US, Netherlands have stable governments. So it's quite attractive to install state backdoors and increase the surveillance on its citizens. But I don't live there, and, I, and this is quite frightening to me. I do not have a stable government. I am Brazilian, 
So you seem to be sure that it's the best policy to be adopted. Well, one year from now, I'll be not be hunting terrorists, but maybe I'll be hunted for being a terrorist, for not being a terrorist, but for being here defending this exactly position. So we cannot endorse some device that simply eases investigation, sacrificing privacy, which is essential to exercising our freedom, because creating a way in for governments, even if it's usually this access will only be done through an independently made aurora, aurora. it is a weakening encryption. We, you cannot have strong cryptography and it has a flaw if it has a flaw by design. Do you see any way of doing this without opening a way to governments, to all users' data? And I don't mean mass surveillance all the time, but simply creating the possibility of future mass surveillance. Because for people like me, who come from countries with a, a history full of dictatorships, that's bad enough. Thank you. Thank you. I think the gentleman there. Hello, this is Gonzalo Lopez Brajas. I work for Telefonica. I'm a little bit puzzled uh, with the debate, and, and I think we're being quite cynical about it. Um, basically, on one side, we're seeing that we're saying that with uh, unrecorded encryption, governments cannot and will not have access to the communications, and that, that technically it's impossible, and they, they sh we should not try to prevent it. But on the other side, we have. Uh, applications, we have our mobile phones that are providing lots of information to companies and w we might be discussing uh, on the privacy how much information we are willing to share with these companies and what is the use that they make out of it. But we are not discussing that they cannot do it. So on the one side, we are allowing companies, businesses to get our data and to get access to lots of personal information such as we where we are, what we do, what are the contents that we access to, and we are saying that we are not allowing legally elected governments that, ha that, uh, that they can have access to the communications that it is provided by the laws that have been approved by all citizens in legally democratic processes. So th this is quite cynical. I think I, I don't see the, the, the why, why do we have this different approach. On one side, we are not allowing governments that are legally elected to have access to our communications to defend security of the nations, but we're allowing companies to have access to our personal data. So maybe the solution is not providing access to encrypted communications, but maybe the solution is to have governments to access uh, the handsets at the end of the devices as the companies are doing. Thank you, do you have a question here or comment? Uh, hello everyone, I'm Bruno Bioni from nick.pr. <coughs> I'd like to hear some uh, thoughts from the representative of governments and also from the Brazilian prosecutor's office. If you can share some statistics, numbers, or you know, empirical evidence uh, of how much is useful to have only access to metadata for solving and prosecuting and investigating crimes, and uh, how 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 much is not useful to only have access to metadata, then go to strictly to the content of the communications to solve, investigate, and create crimes. Basically, I mean, following the reasoning that was made by the professor Ian, you know, trying to, to point out, come out with uh, empirical evidence, to trying to use big analytics on traffic data for policy. So, I want to ask the panel if you can make like a compromise of people trying to keep in like one minute or something. Then we can give a chance for everyone to do some closing, uh, uh, some closing thoughts here. So I don't know where we can start. Uh, so everyone will have a chance to speak now to answer or to do. So the quicker we start, so can we go? You so Sahil doesn't have. So Monica, you can start, and then we go. close to the mic as I can. Um, a lot of people have been posing the question of um, how can we strike the right balance and I think that is the one 
million dollar question that um, I don't think we'll be able to solve in the near future. But um, fr just from a company perspective, I think the um, while I would like to make the disclaimer that I am not a, a WhatsApp employee, I am a Facebook Brazil employee. Um, WhatsApp is part of the uh, Facebook group of uh, companies. Um, and the one challenge uh, we face and um, Okay, so I'm um, not going to start over, uh, but um, I just uh, would like to state that the one uh, challenge that we're currently facing is um, in order to strike the balance. Um, Facebook as a company is uh, willing to compromise and provide as much access to um, the data that is technically feasible, feasible to provide and of course under due process of law. So when we talk about metadata, when we talk about unencrypted information, um, if it's a lawful process, if it's a court order, we are willing to comply and our family you know, group of families are willing to comply. I think the one problem that we face right now is when we are unable, technically unable, to comply with those orders, such as um, wiretapping requests for um, content that's end-to-end -end encrypted or um, static content that's end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, so our executives are being arrested. Um, we're um, facing huge uh, fines, billionaire fines, uh, because of the technical inability to provide content to encrypted services. But um, um, apart from that, everything else that we collect, and I was um, you know, uh, perfectly raised by the, the gentleman, um, and that can be used to help law enforcement uh, keep us safe, and we deeply respect law enforcement's uh, work. Um, and if it follows the due process, we are um, willing to cooperate. I'd like to answer the question. Uh, we use metadata to do investigation. We have a lot of tools, infiltration of a person in, in systems. But uh, sometimes it's necessary the encrypted data too. And uh, in, in Brazilian situation, uh, uh, as uh, what's happened, for instance, in many cases, even the metadata, which is not encrypted in any other application, was not delivered, making it impossible to start the investigation of serious crimes, such as the planet murder of public agents or other actions of criminal organizations. Uh, Brazil, as Moreno said, that uh, uh, we. Uh, you not worry about uh, terrorism, but we have another serious crimes to investigate it too. So, uh, but it, it's necessary the encrypted data in some investigations too. Although we have another uh, tools to, to, to investigate. Okay. Ve very short, I just want to add uh, for, on for the person from Minas Gerais, that's from my mother where I was born, born. but uh, I agree we do unfortunately have not a stability in the government now, but please, please trust us because the law enforcement is stable. We are, wor we are working on that, we are accompanying the projects of law around this and we are doing a really, really work with uh, uh, in the human rights way, in the law enforcement way and based on uh, uh, very, very uh, specialized people. So I would like just to calm down that besides the government we are trying and we are being stable. Thank you. the mic here too. Thank you. Thank you for raising the point on the commercial use and collection of data. Um, even though it was may maybe not specifically addressed within this panel, this is indeed um, part of the issue as well. And um, we are certainly on our side pushing for strong data minimization practices in order to reduce this amount of data collected by company, not only for um, surveillance and intelligence reason, but just for the fact that um, I'd like to push back on the point that people are willingly giving away data. There is a lot, a great deal of data that is being collected without our no knowledge and our consent, uh, which go well beyond the, the purpose of providing certain services. So 
we also need to indeed look into more the commercial use of data and put some strict boundaries or, uh, around which data is necessary for specific purposes and which data company really needs about us in order to deliver those service because at the moment the reality is that companies are over collecting data and keeping them for way too long uh, comparing to the purpose for which they need to use. Thank you. Um, I guess just some closing thoughts in no particular order. Um, so I shouldn't have, I, maybe I sounded a bit down on the companies. They are very good to us in a lot of circumstances uh, and have helped us significantly after several uh, attacks have provided requisite metadata when we needed it. So um, thank you. Uh, but it is that technically impossible to reply to warrants that, that is still our challenge. Um, and I think, uh, and you know, and I think our ministers certainly would consider it irresponsible if they gave up on that fight um, because that their job is ultimately being accountable for keeping citizens safe. Um, and that is why it seems like this endless conversation. Um, but that is why this continues, is because there's a serious political priority uh, to essentially fulfill the state's responsibility to its citizens. Um, but saying that companies have been exceptionally helpful in a lot of instances. Um, I think on the, uh, you know, what about different stable governments or unstable governments, it would be very diplomatically inappropriate of me to comment on different governments. Um, but, um, you know, I think from the UK perspective, one of the biggest questions that we face in a lot of internet-related public policy is why can you do this and not X country? Um, and we go for the line that, you know, we have an independent judiciary, uh, democratic accountability, due process, and, we're already, and we aim to target a known threat. Um, you, you know, there are specific and defined <coughs> limits to what we ask, and we only want the access, of, uh, access to communications of individuals who are actually under suspicion. Um, but we recognize that in other countries, that is not always the case, and there may be political purposes for why people want to obtain information. Um, and that is a real challenge. But again, that's for the responsibility. You know, I don't think we want a state backdoor. That would never be our policy, certainly never out loud. No, I'm kidding. That would never be our policy. Um, but, um, but I think we... Um, but I think, you know, we do face challenges in trying to justify why we should be able to do something, um, but recognizing that there are other states in which that, that is not a feasible option. Um, and that is, that, is a, that is a real challenge, and that is why discussions like this are really, really useful. Um, and then finally, on just um, the commercial use of data that Estelle and others have raised, um, it's funny, when I first started in government, um, people said, but Google and Facebook have access to all these things, and why does everyone let them do that? And, um, and there's a question about you know, consent, uh, and that you're consenting when you sign up to someone's terms of service. Um, but for me, I think an interesting question, which is not for this discussion, is you know, what are those terms of service? What do they actually say, and are they actually intelligible? Uh, so, you know, if you're thinking about especially extending services to developing countries, you know, how do you improve literacy on those terms of service? And that's something that we're just quite interested in uh, in the future. Um, but certainly the commercial use of data is something which I think we find really challenging is that, you know, these companies, everything, I'll be quick. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I would just add, you know, like I said at the beginning, we are keenly aware of the importance of protecting human <coughs> rights online. Um, there isn't an absolute right to privacy in the UK. Uh, as Nina outlined, you know, you can interfere with those rights when it is proportionate and necessary to do so. Um, and that is where we will continue. We are not trying to go any further than is within our bounds of international law and our international responsibility. Nina? Like, we have another session starting in five minutes, so this is, I'm kind of uh, <laughs> nervous I'll be here. As so. short as possible. I think there were some really good questions, good positions, remarks from the floor. They show how difficult it is for a policymaker to actually draft policy from this, because they showed the different perspectives and aspects. Uh, somehow I'm a, a little bit glad that I didn't hear anything that's really new to me, because otherwise that would have meant that maybe our policy isn't weighing things uh, fully and uh, completely. Um, however, I think it's not so much to, to be able to strike the balance, but as Eleanor put it quite well in the beginning, it's more of reconciling the legitimate interests that are out there ensuring the right safeguards for legal access, creating the necessary awareness for your citizens to protect themselves, having the right dialogue with the providers. I think these different aspects, they can be reconciled. We, we just keep on working around it. So thanks very much for your partic active participation. I'll be quick. Um, this debate isn't a debate anymore. It's really over. 
governments are never going to, again, enjoy the unfettered access to the contents of communications and documents that they used to have. You're not going to get that back. You need to adapt to living in a world of ubiquitously available encryption. Whereas you acknowledge, you're n even if whatever laws you take, the technology is still going to be out there and people will still be able to get their hands on it. And so we've seen some gestures towards evolution and adaptation through metadata, through lawful hacking, through vulnerability uh, exploitation, and all the commercial data that companies gather, that's going to be available through to the government through different legal processes. Sometimes that might be slow due to, you know, we talked about cross-data, uh, cross-border data access, et cetera, but it's there. There are all these different workarounds. That's a term that's come up over and over again. And going forward, that's something that you have to focus on because I dispute that historically this is always available in all circumstances, but you need to adapt and change because we're not having this debate anymore. We can keep going in circles, but the era of unfettered access is, is done. So let's discuss how to move forward and what the restrictions there should be on these new workarounds. Thanks. I thank you also for being in this meeting. It was, uh, we had very good questions from the floor and uh, it was very, very interesting to be here. Uh, I, I really don't believe in, in circumventing uh, things uh, via some kind of, of bad technology like back, door, back doors or something like that. And of course, uh, the bad thing is uh, anything that could be made would be, would be made in, in technology. But they cannot read our minds until now at, at least. And thank you again. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I just want to make one quick point in response to the comment from over here. Um, uh, I'm not, just from the US perspective, I'm not hearing uh, a call for back doors. I'm not hearing calls for unfettered access. Um, so hopefully that is somewhat reassuring. Um, but I totally agree that um, we need to think about how um, the actions by sort of, you know, <coughs> strong, in countries with strong rule of law will be um, taken up by in countries with weak rule of law and how we explain the differences between them. Um, I think that's a critical issue. Mm -hmm. I think I would agree, and I think it's right. I mean, the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, there will be no way back before strong encryption, and uh, that's not, not what I want to say. I think I have the good news is that this is going to happen. The bad news is that the underlying policy problem, it's not a technology issue, as I said, is going to continue, that you have to put, you know, in a balanced way, whatever word we will want to use, um, the different rights in question. Um, and just a final thought, not to frustrate you, but maybe for the next debate. Um, uh, the, the last 20 years or even longer, um, telecommunication provider have fought uh, really heavily, my company included, to not give direct access to governments to networks. So basically the uh, legal intercept systems installed um, have a nice feature of checks and balances in the sense that governments can ask us, but we have a chance to, to check on the formal way that it was done and so on. We can have redress re mechanisms and go to courts and so on and so forth. <laughs> so that was a check and balances system uh, put in place, which I think gave at least a, a, a formal way of getting to a balanced uh, approach. Um, when we go to legal hacking, for example, this is the fantastic direct access. They will put a piece of software on your mobile phone and they have direct access to all you do. There's no one in the middle anymore. I mean, that's the fact. So, I mean, I don't want to frustrate you, but you know, strong encryption will lead us just you know, to a different battle in a different area, which is going to be a legal hacking of, of devices. Thank you very much, all the panelists. Thank you, people in the audience. Uh, we don't have time for any more questions. I think it was a very enlightening panel. Uh, the audience raised questions that we didn't have time to raise, like data protection, and uh, all about like protecting keys. But I would like to pass the word to Mr. Carlos Afonso, who wants to make some closing words. Thank you from our part for being here and for participating. Okay, thank you very much for a nice panel on a complex issue and uh, with very qualified panel and the audience. And as a co-organizer, I am happy with it and I look forward to take a very detailed reading of the transcripts, because there are so many interesting ideas, questions, and positions, and we have to go through that. Thank you very much.
That's what I meant. That, that's, what, that's what I meant by camera, yeah. I just, gave, I just wrote my address on the... Oh, wait. Oh, I have to. I just, I just wrote my name on the back of the gun.